Isaac Newton taught us to perfection about how an apple flies. And his laws of motion have been proven extremely strongly right for apples and things like that. That's beautiful, because that's a great setting for a scientist. We have a model that we can test. We can do this experiment many, many times, and we will find out that it's just true, except for some friction of air or so. Great. However, this will not tell us anything about the flight of an electron. Electrons just don't behave like apples, and the only way to find out about that is by watching electrons fly, or measuring flights of electrons. And when that happened, people found out that they completely differ from apples, and that gave rise to what we now know as quantum mechanics. If we want to find out about how the brain works, and this is something that I'm passionate about and I really want to understand, and maybe you want a little bit, then, of course, we can present the brain with stimuli like, let's say, a face, and then watch the brain activate. Which regions in the brain do light up? And then we present something else like piano music and may see different regions of the brain light up. And I'm pretty sure that all of you have seen images like this. We actually saw one earlier today, and often, every once in a while, in the magazines, they occur stories about brain activation, multicolored brains. That's great. That's great technology, and we can measure this many, many times to extreme precision. However, we may not find out how the brain works, because to understand that, we will have to look in much more detail into the brain. And if we do that, the first thing you will discover there, and this has actually been discovered 100 years ago, are brain cells. What you see there is one neuron with all its complexity. The cell body is just the small thing in the middle, and the rest are the tentacles of a neuron called dendrites. And there's even much more to this. So this is a, an entire cell almost, including the axon, which is also part of that same neuron. This is just one cell. And there's even more to that in the brain. It's not just that the single cells are complex, there are very many of them. In the human brain, as far as we know today, it's roughly 70 billion neurons. So hopefully in each of our brains, 70 billion. That's a lot. That's stunning and that's pretty impressive. But wait, what about the liver? There are also billions of hepatocytes, that is liver cells in your liver. But arguably, the liver is not as powerful, in certain ways at least, as the brain. So it can't be just the sheer number of cells. It has to be something else. And if we think a step further, then we realize that a single liver cell only has a few neighbors. That is, the cells directly surrounding that very cell. However, a neuron, a nerve cell, has, as we know today, approximately a thousand neighbors in the sense that it directly talks to them via what we call synapses. So this is really a lot. Maybe you can compare this to, say, the number of people you have ever directly communicated with. And then you may gauge your popularity to that of a neuron. A thousand is a lot. And this is really what makes the brain special, the connectivity within it, the networks within the brain, and therefore, you can argue that if you really want to understand how the brain works, you will have to measure these networks. OK, great. So now we have a task. Um, let's just do it. Why hasn't that been done? We have neuroscience since at least 100 years. The problem is that these nerve cells are very tricky to follow. In the following sense, they are very, very thin at their thinnest parts. They are so small that the diameter is just 50 nanometers at some places. And that's really, really, really small, 50 nanometers. At the same time, however, they span distances easily of millimeters or centimeters. To spell it out, that's 10 million nanometers. So what you have to do to reconstruct a brain cell is to go from 50 nanometer resolution all the way to something like 10 million nanometers in scope. And that is difficult. And that is why, during the entire last century, this has not become a routine method in neuroscience. We could not routinely map circuits. Luckily, over the last 
10 years or so, at some places in the world, among those Heidelberg, where I'm from at the moment, people develop methods that allow us to measure networks in the brain. And this is what I want to show you now, how recently we got the tools to get, to get there. What we do is we take a piece of brain, and then we put that into the proper microscope, which is an electron microscope, because electrons can resolve much finer than light can. And then um, we take the electron beam and scan the surface of the tissue block, take an image, as you can see on the right. And then we have an, a diamond knife built into the electron microscope that then cuts off the top of the surface of this tissue block. And because that's all happening within one machine, this can be automated and happen many, many times. That is thousands and thousands of times. And because the diamond is very, very sharp, the diamond knife, the cuts are very, very thin. And this allows us to get a high-resolution data set of nerve tissue. These experiments take weeks and weeks. The machine that is shown here was developed by Winfried Denk and collaborators over the last years. And this is how we are using um, an electron microscope and new technology to get data about nerve tissue. OK, that's fine. That's just the experiment. Now, let's look at some of this data. So this is a movie running through the data. Um, and what you see coming out of it here now in red is one nerve cell. It's just one of the many nerve cells in this block of tissue. But you may acknowledge the complexity of this kind of data and potentially um, the beauty of something like a nerve cell. Let's take a different view. Let's now, instead of looking from the outside, put ourselves into the position of being inside one neuride. So what you see in the center would be one diameter of a neuride. And now let's consider flying along that neuride, just to get an idea of what it means to find the path through the labyrinth and, uh, of, the, of the brain. So now we are going to fly along that neuride. And you will soon notice that things can get pretty complex. Now we are getting to a branch point, and we are flying on still flying through nerve tissue. You may focus on the middle part, but maybe I can also point you to the surrounding for the next phase of the flight. And you will notice how complex nerve tissue is. It's not only densely packed, but it's very complex. And all of the rounded structures you see out there are other neurons, which can be actually very far away with their cell bodies, and that they make their way all the way to this particular location. So what you see here is, uh, I think, uh, an impression of the density and complexity of nerve tissue. And by the way, the distance we just traveled was 30 micrometers. And earlier today, we heard that a human hair has a diameter of 50 micrometers. So we just traveled a distance across not even a human hair, just to get an idea of what scale we're looking at here. OK, let's um, think a little bit about how this reconstruction just happened. So what we want to do is we want to follow neurons, which in this sketchy picture look like spaghetti, um, through the brain. And if we do that, um, then that means that currently, actually, a human does that, which means one person judges this to be the correct neuroid, one brain, if you want. How do we know he is correct or she? We don't. Maybe he or she missed a branch point there. So what can we do to um, check on that? Well, just let's ask somebody else to also trace that neuroid. And we may discover that the other person disagrees or agrees. So we have two votes. And then naturally, um, if they disagree, you will add more and really more, like a dozen, or much more than a dozen, like a hundred, which we are really doing. So we have currently a team of close to 150 undergraduates in Heidelberg, which we are paying to do that, um, who annotate the kind of data you just saw, who fly through the brain for us. And then we combine what they find out, which you can call crowdsourcing. Behind that is a lot of statistics about how you judge all of that, having, having many people do the same thing. And combine it with computer output, and then get to a reconstruction. Now, I want to show you some data that we've um, recently put together. It's uh, partly preliminary. Um, this is now a movie through one of those um, data blocks. Just to get an idea again, this is uh, just the uh, gray value data coming out of the electron microscope. And now we see a reconstruction of just the cell bodies within that volume. That's um, close to 1,000 in that very small piece of, uh, of tissue. And then, of course, the really interesting thing is to then ask our team 
um, to reconstruct this, and this is what we got out, which is uh, half of that, so half a thousand of cells um, fully reconstructed within that volume with the help of this large tracer team. Let's have a look. Let's fly in a little bit. So we are now going to dive into a piece, in this case, of retina. This is actually a part of the brain. The retina is the outmost part of the brain, if you want. So we are going to dive in. These neurons um, are colored by their types. That's, that's not the main point here. But you will get an impression of the density and complexity of this uh, kind of tissue. And this is only a third of the cells in this volume. We left out for this movie all the others. And please be aware, this is not simulated, this is not made up, this is not statistics, this is measured. So this is the real circuits in a piece of nerve tissue. Great. So what do we do with this? We wanted to analyze networks. So the next step is contact detection between these cells, and then we come up with what you can call a connectivity matrix, or if you want to spin it more, the brain's matrix. But be aware, this is just a very, very small piece of brain currently. And this is where we wanted to get, and this is where we're starting to get, at least for small circuits, that we're able to map connectivity in nerve tissue at the scale and precision um, that is needed to, uh, to, to understand these kinds of circuits. So this is one example. Um, again, we took a piece of brain, used many brains, that is those of our annotators, to get at the connectivity matrix. We did it for a few hundred of neurons, or close to a thousand neurons right now. The real goal that, that I really want to push for is cortex. This is the part of the brain directly beneath your skull. This is the main part of the brain in the sense that it is the highest order part of the brain. We are pretty sure that that is where we think and feel and watch and taste and listen. And that's why looking at sensory cortex and the structure of sensory cortex will be a major endeavor. There we are talking about thousands of neurons. So that is still um, a challenge ahead of us. And this is something that I'm now uh, going to pursue in Munich at the Max Planck Institute with my own lab. So to summarize, what I tried to convey today and uh, share my commitment to this was if we want to understand the brain, we have to care for the details. And the details are about networks. We have to map networks. And it's exciting that we have the technology at hand right now to start mapping networks in the brain. To do that properly, we need to scale up. And just again, confronted with the most fascinating biological device that you can possibly imagine, which are our insanely great brains, we aspire to combine thousands of these devices to crack its code. Thank you very much. <laughs>